Nielsen family, and this week is the second week of Advent, and we will be lighting the peace candle. Great, say my favorite thing. My favorite thing um, is having a Christmas tree with lights. It's so good to be with you this morning, Macho Church. Uh, I will be reading from our Advent devotional that we're going through together, Let Earth Receive Her King. Uh, the first scripture that we're reading is Mark chapter 1, uh, verses 1 through 8. It says this, The beginning of the good news about Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet, I will send my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. And so John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him, confessing their sins. They were baptized by him in the Jordan River. John wore clothing made of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. And this was his message. After me comes the one more powerful than the uh. After me comes the one more powerful than I, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. And the second reading is from 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 8 and 9, and also verse 14. But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years. Okay, sit down, baby. I need them right down here so I can pick one. And you got to look at the camera. Thank you. I know, you have to come right here. After. Yeah, so Dad has to do the reading first, baby. Sit down. Verses 8, 9, and 14. But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. So then, dear friends, since you are looking forward to this, make every effort to be found spotless, blameless, and at peace with him. We like the peace kids. <laughs> and now, we like the peace kids. Merry, Merry Christmas. Christmas. <laughs> Perfect. Perfect. The peace candle, the real kind of peace that we uh, all kind of uh, live through and enjoy. Uh, thanks, Austin and family. So uh, my task for you in the next couple of minutes is to kind of share with you and update you uh, some things that are going on. And uh, I think you all know this, but let me just give you kind of an overview. Uh, we do something here every year. Traditionally, we haven't been able to kind of connect so much in 2020, but uh, around September, we try to update you and uh, get you up to speed on all the projects that are going on through something we call Faith Promise, where each of us uh, promised by faith to give some money uh, towards other people. Uh, faith Promise 100% goes to other projects and other partnerships uh, around our city and literally around the world. Uh, last year, uh, you raised, uh, you know, about $350,000 that were given away to other ministries and other projects and, and, and other causes in our community. Uh, and when you couple that with what was given through Because You Matter, our 501c3 nonprofit, non-religious, so if you're a part of uh, some of those giving programs through your corporate, you can give to that uh, non-religious nonprofit. Uh, but we gave away almost $500,000 last year to other ministries. And so I wanted to update you on a couple of our primary partnerships and then kind of give you an update on how Faith Promise Giving is going and where we are. This beautiful network that has been built through our partnerships just means that through 2020 and a lot of things being offline, we have continued to do ministry around the world. And uh, whether you know it or not, we've been in contact with our friends in Eswatini, uh, and uh, if you take a look at this photo, you can see a, a picture of Sabello down at the bottom. He is our in-country coordinator right now, a, an incredibly gifted young professional, and he's coordinating. And this year, you and us together, we committed to build a new preschool in a place called Emlambini. 
And, uh, and so uh, it has actually gone from a blank piece of property to the building that you see here. And there's a part of that congregation. And uh, it's a great facility. Uh, about $30,000 went into getting it to this point. It needs about another 25000 to be completed. And that's a part of our planning for 2021 and what that looks like. But I just wanted you to know that while 2020 was going on and COVID was going on and lockdown was going on, this beautiful building has been built in the southern part of Eswatini. Uh, it's getting ready to house a, a brand new preschool that's already meeting but needs a facility desperately. And so uh, we've been in the midst of all of that. Uh, and then another partnership that we are just now starting way back in June uh, when so many of the things began to happen around race relations and the situations that were being faced in the African-American community and what that meant, we really said, we don't, we don't just want to respond in sensitivity. We'd like to get connected and understand some things. And so uh, we reached out to a church in Altadena and uh, began to meet with Pastor John, uh, the Altadena Fountain of Life Church of the Nazarene. And uh, we kind of sat down and said, this is what we'd like to do. First of all, we'd like to just get together as pastors and get to know you better and get to know the needs better of your congregation. But we'd also like to get our congregations together uh, at least a couple of times a year just so we can build relationships and get to know each other and understand things that are happening. And uh, so 2020 has kind of kept us from doing a lot of those things. But the very first question we asked them is, is there something that we could do that could really help you, a need that you have right now that's a really vivid one? And they shared with us the fact that uh, they really weren't ready to go online. They really weren't ready to have an online presence. They didn't have a great homepage, a great web presence. They didn't have a great Facebook page. And they are doing all of their services by Zoom call. And, uh, and so we said, we're going to figure out if we can find a way that you can live stream much the way we do. And so we've committed to help them. They have a Facebook page. They're, they have a better online presence, but we still need to put together the infrastructure. So around Christmas, we are committing to try to raise about $15,000, 15 to 20, that would allow us to really help them to be able to live stream the same way we do. Uh, might not be as many cameras, not by kind of quite as sophisticated of a switching system, but we think for a little amount of money, we could really help them. And we want to be in partnership with our brothers and sisters in the African-American community. And we don't just want to do a few things, and we don't just want to do some tokens. We want to actually build friendship and relationship. And so we're inviting you to be a part of that. Saving Innocence is going on. Uh, we're building backpacks. Uh, last year, we did about 100 of those. They're not cheap. But uh, that's one of the Christmas projects that we are, in which we are engaged, and we're inviting you to be a part of that. So let me give you some financial update. Uh, last year at this point, we'd raised about $90,000 uh, from our September time to, to now when we kick off Faith Promise. Uh, this year, we've raised about thirty. dollars So obviously, uh, $60,000 behind. We're still giving money to our partnerships. There's ministry going on at Tierra del Sol. There's ministry going on in downtown LA at Central City. Uh, there's ministry going on uh, with Saving Innocence, uh, ministry going on with STARS, after school programs, as we find other ways to serve while we're suspended, sort of, in some of our traditional ways. So I'm just inviting you right now to think about Faith Promise and to think about getting caught up. You got a letter from me, and there's some stuff about tithes and offerings and getting back on track with all of that stuff. Listen, this is a part of the life of the church. And part of how we share and how we do ministry is by connecting into these deep networks and by having long-term relationships, which means people rely on us. And so if you're able to catch up, if you're able to contribute, if this idea of helping out uh, at Altadena, if that really appeals to you, if you get really excited about finishing out the preschool uh, in Amlambini, then, then would you just contribute? Would you just make it be possible and, uh, and share it together? And so we're going to say a prayer here in a minute. Let me remind you of a couple of other things that are going on that are really important. There's a blood drive coming up on December 9th. And, and what we found out is that the Red Cross is in great need of blood. And because of COVID, people are not, they're not showing up to donate. And if they sign up, they often don't show up. So here's a way. It costs no money. It just costs some time and a little bit of your lifeblood. Uh, would you sign up online and make this happen as that comes up uh, later this week on Wednesday? 
And then I mentioned the backpacks. Uh, uh, please go online, get that information. Uh, those interventions are still going to happen, and they're going to need that support. So think about all of that. And then two scheduling things that you need to know about. Next week is the children's Christmas musical. There will be no in-person gathering next week. This is all going to be online. Uh, you got to see this. In fact, in a minute, we're going to show you a little video to get you ready. Uh, this will be uh, the 32nd annual children's musical, and we're not missing it just because of COVID. And so we're inviting you to come. I'll be a part of that and sharing some devotional thoughts as we lead in and lead out of that uh, great, great production. And then uh, so be prepared for that. Be ready for that. Be online with us next week. Uh, it's a big, big deal, and our kids have worked really hard, as has our staff and volunteers, so be ready for that. And then Christmas Eve, right now we do have one in-person gathering scheduled. It's at 4 p.m. You do need to register online, and uh, if that thing fills up and the demand is so great, then we'll try to move earlier into the day and add another service. Uh, but uh, go online. There is one in-person. There will be an online streaming uh, service that runs at noon on Christmas Eve, and we're doing it early so that you can tap into it anytime you want throughout the day. So take a look at all of that. One last thing. At the end of this service, we are sharing communion. It's Communion Sunday, so get your elements together and ready. And now, deep breath. We'd like for you to take a look at this as we prepare our hearts for the message. Good morning, church. Well, it is Christmas time, which around here at Montrose Church traditionally means that it's kids musical time. One of the things that we started thinking of in March, April, when we started this quarantine immediately was we can't lose the kids musical. We have to figure out how to do this. And so David Moore, once again this year, wrote a great script. Uh, I put together, wrote some songs. And in August, the kids started rehearsing for the kids musical every Wednesday night over Zoom. For a half hour, they'd be with uh, Juliana, who you see singing with us on Sundays, and they'd go through the songs on Zoom, and then they'd break off into little groups and rehearse their scenes. And then we started the filming process. A lot of the filming was done in the kids' homes with parents using iPhones, recording them singing uh, and sometimes acting, saying out lines uh, for some of the scenes. And then uh, for the bigger scenes, for the bigger characters, we brought kids in two or three at a time, totally socially distanced, masked cameramen and audio guys, as few people as we could get in the room. And they acted out the scenes in front of a green screen. So much work has gone into this musical this year from the kids, from the parents, from volunteers, from staff. Uh, we knew that this had to be part of the Christmas season. And like we say every year, we believe that the kids have an important story to tell, especially at this time. And so we're finally here. We're putting the final touches on it and we are a week away. December 13th is our kids musical. And we really, really hope uh, that you tune in for it next week. Love you guys. Well, it's an honor to be able to be here with you, to be able to celebrate this second week of Advent as we celebrate and look into the whole idea of what does it mean to be people of peace and to not be people that are fearing anything. And today we're going to talk about fearing timing a little bit. And so I brought a little hourglass from my office. Uh, don't worry, it's a, not an hour that's going to time me on my preaching. But I just want us to, I'm going to sit this right here. Uh, because I think it's interesting, as we begin to think about time, I don't know about you, but time is something that's a mystery to me. Uh, time is something that kind of blows my mind when I think about the whole balance of of God coming into the midst of time, not only for Zechariah that we're going to read about today and Elizabeth, but also Christ himself, that in the midst of time, God is there. Uh, I remember many, many years ago watching Dr. Carl Sagan as an astrophysicist, and he's talking about the, the galaxies and the billions and billions of stars and how that impacts uh, not only destiny and time and things like that. And I remember then as I became a Christian, 
that my mind was just expanded with the thought that what does it really mean that God is beyond time, that God enters into time? Uh, maybe it's just me, uh, but then it began to get a little confusing at different times. Because if God is stepping into time, then I'd always ask the question, well, what about this time that I'm going through? Uh, what about this situation? And, you know, usually we take comfort in one or two different ways. Either we take comfort in the fact that, uh, you know, we'll say everything happens for a reason and, a reason, and God's timing is always perfect. Uh, or we'll take the other thing is that in the midst of this time, God wants to teach me so many different things. And, and today, I don't know about you, but I, I struggle with some of both of those answers. That I believe them at one level, but at the other side... Timing works really good when everything is going well, uh, but timing sometimes can be difficult when things are not going well. Uh, and, and so as we look at the scriptures today, this comes from 30 years of pastoring and dealing with some different difficult situations that I've had to pastor people through where timing was not right. It works well when and we look up to God and we say, thank you, God, that the car missed us at the red light. And as it was running and it missed us, and we say, thank you, Lord. But what does that mean theologically as I say God steps into time when there is a tragedy, when there is job loss, there is health-related issues, that COVID for some ends up being not very difficult, but then others, it ends up ending in death. And so in your situation, maybe you've gone through that, where you've said, Lord, where are you in the midst of time? Where are you in the midst of this difficult day? And you might be there right now, but I believe more than anything is that God manifests his sovereignty and his love, that he is continually present, and he is here to bring us peace. Uh, this whole discussion of time and thinking again about the hourglass, I, I'm reminded of one of my favorite uh, movies called The Greatest Showman. And maybe you've seen it, uh, but there's a scene in it where you've got Zac Efron as a Anglo-American, white American that is falling in love with Zendaya, who is uh, African-American, a person of color. And they're both singing in this song called Rewrite the Stars uh, about the fact that who is creating the destiny in front of us. And uh, just listen to uh, Zac Efron says, You claim it's not in the cards that fate is pulling you miles away from me and out of reach from me, but you're here in my heart, so who can stop me if I decide that you're my destiny? Uh, and he says, what if we rewrite the stars, say that you were made to be mine, for nothing can keep us apart, for you are the one I was meant to find. So it's up to you, it's up to me, no one can say what's meant to be, so why don't we rewrite the stars? And then she comes into this, and again, The Greatest Showman is based on about P.T. Barnum in the 1800s. And so the whole idea of interracial relationship was not something that was accepted. And so she steps in and she says... There are mountains and there are doors that we can't walk through. No one can rewrite the stars. How can you say that you'll be mine? Everything keeps us apart. I'm not the one you are meant to find. It's not up to you. It's not up to me. When anyone tells us what we can be, so how can we rewrite the stars and say that the world's world will be ours tonight? Uh, my, my brain goes through both of those different dichotomies of uh, are, are we involved to be part of rewriting God's work in the world, or do we sit back and wait for him to rewrite the stars and the destiny? And as I look at scriptures, we look at the scriptures today, I, I say yes to both of those. It is that God has this covenant relationship with us, that he is loving and that he is always available. At the same time, we have a covenant relationship with him, that he desires us to be faithful and ready to be able to do his will. As Pastor Dave talked about all the different partnerships, uh, you have been so faithful, and we'll talk about that a little bit more. You have been faithful to respond. But as we talk about peace instead of fear, I think it's interesting that there's always that balance, that there's things that God gives by his Holy Spirit to bring us peace, but at the same time that he wants us to be people of peace, to make peace, to grant peace into our world and into our relationships. And so both work together as we think about that. Uh, it's interesting how God steps in the midst of time, and we, we don't control those things. But I was thinking of some different quotes uh, that support that scripture. 
Abraham Lincoln at the Gettysburg Address, uh, which I think was, again, fascinating. He says, The world will little note nor long remember what we say here, but it can never forget what they did here. So here he is saying that my words really are not going to last the test of time, but they did for some reason. They did send the, er, last the test of time. Eleanor Roosevelt at the 1940 Democratic Convention, only 20 years after women were given the right to vote, said, this is no ordinary time, no time except for what is best for the country as a whole. And so time impacts our ability to be able to then move and respond, but God ends up anointing that and connecting with his covenant. Dr. King said that the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. It bends towards what is right. It bends towards righteousness. That the arc of the covenant, or the arc of the moral universe goes that way, towards what is right. And as I think about that, and maybe just me, I end up thinking about what does it mean like where I'm born and what century I'm born in. 1800s was completely different than the 20th century. If I was born in Eswatini, if I was born in America, where I was born, what generation I was born into. And again, maybe it's just me, but I end up thinking that theology to work, it has to be right in all situations. So where is God in the midst of timing? And the fact is, is where do I really sense his presence in the midst of this time that I find myself. Uh, this past week I was reading Dr. Daniel's uh, devotional that, uh, that Austin had read, and I think it was on Tuesday, he says that prisoners of hope are not exempt from times of lament. Prisoners of hope are not guaranteed, fr guaranteed freedom from exhaustion. However, prisoners of hope are promised times of renewal. God's people are continually reinvigorated by knowing that the Lord is everlasting and that the Creator does not grow tired or weary and that God gives strength to the worn out and power to the weak. And so we're gonna, we are prisoners of hope. As we look at scriptures today, we're going to look at Zechariah and Elizabeth. A little bit of background. Uh, we know from scripture that we're about to read that Zechariah was a priest. He was a direct descendant of Aaron. Uh, there was over 20,000 priests during that time. Too many for anyone to be able to serve and to be able to go into the temple. And so they ended up creating lots. Uh, they drew lots of who would have the ability to do that. But on the day that Zechariah's lot was gone to, or drawn towards him, uh, what was the emotion that he was feeling? He'd be ready for this. He'd been prepared for it. Uh, William Barclay says, It's quite possible that many priests would have never had the privilege of burning incense all of his life. But if the lot does fall on any priest that day, that was the greatest day in their life, the day that they longed for and that they dreamed for. And on this day, the lot fell on Zacharias, and he would be thrilled to the core of his being. And so as we read Scripture, we want to think about the emotion of that, of the mystery of time stepping into it, but yet also the response uh, from Zechariah. And so listen to the word from Luke chapter 1, verse 5 with me. It says, In the time of Herod, king of Judah, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly division of Abijah. And his wife Elizabeth was also a descendant of Aaron. Both of them were upright in the sight of God, observing all of the Lord's commandments and regulations blamelessly. But they had no children, because Elizabeth was barren and they were well along in years. And once when Zechariah's division was on duty, he was serving as the priest before God. He was chosen by lot, according to the custom of the priesthood, to go into the temple of the Lord and to burn incense. And when the time for the burning of incense came, all the assembled worshipers were praying outside. And then the angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing at the right hand side of the altar of incense. And when Zechariah saw him, he was startled and gripped with fear. But the angel of the Lord said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son. You will give him the name John. He will be a joy and a delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth. For he will be a great in the sight of the Lord. He will never take wine or ferment a drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even from birth. And many of the people of Israel will bring back to the Lord their God. And he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and the power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the father to the children and disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous, 
to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. And Zechariah asked the angel, how can I be sure of this? I'm only an old man and my wife is well along in years. And the angel answered, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God and I have been sent to speak to you and to tell you this good news. And now you will be silent and not able to speak until the day this happens because you do not believe my words which will come true at their proper time. And meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zechariah and wondering why he stayed so long in the temple. And when he came out, he could not speak to them. They realized he had seen a vision in the temple, for he kept making signs to them, but remained unable to speak. And when his time of service was completed, he returned home, and after his wife Elizabeth became pregnant for five months, remained in seclusion. The Lord has done this for me, she said. In these days, he has shown his favor and taken away my disgrace among the people. I, I read that whole scripture just because what an amazing story. That there's this balance of God coming into a specific time in history, but at the same time believing that God is always available to us. And we want to look at the scripture. And as I look at this scripture again, I, I state this is my own journey. I, I don't have all of the answers on this, but I do know that God desires for us to not fear and to be people of peace. Uh, as we look at this, let's look at the first thing, is that we see his general covenant uh, begin, even at the beginning, uh, we see the story of Elizabeth and Zechariah. It says that she was still barren. Uh, it begins with her barrenness, and she even uses the word disgrace a little bit later on. And I think this is important, but as she is barren, notice that in verse 6, it says that they were both seen as righteous before God, even though they were barren. I don't want us to cruise by this too fast, because I think it's really important that we don't miss the fact that God saw this, them as righteous before there was the promise of the child. I think that's important because quite often we look at society, we look at our own circumstances, and maybe just me, but because of circumstances, I question whether or not I am righteous. I question where God is at. I question his timing into this situation to say, God, what are you trying to teach me? Uh, we look through our own lens of circumstances, and that we know that God is continually working on our behalf, uh, but often we're saying, Lord, I know that you're with me when everything's going well, and he is. He is with us. But how often when we feel barren, we feel like we're in disgrace, we feel tired, we feel exhausted, we feel like when the job is going great, he is with us, but sometimes we doubt when the job is not there. And so the scripture here reminds us right from the beginning that we need to not fear our time of barrenness. We need to be faithful. And that the focus of this is not necessarily just, and we'll talk about the expectancy and the child coming true in a little bit, little bit. But I don't want us to jump to the fact that, oh, he's only faithful if everything goes well. Only when the child comes, because we know individuals who have lost children. We know individuals who, not only when you get the job that God is with you, but also when you lose the job, he's, he's with you. And that the scripture reminds us in the totality of scripture that we need to not fear that time of barrenness, but he calls us to be faithful. So don't fear, be faithful. God sees you as righteous. Uh, quite often, even in working in Skid Row, working in downtown LA, there were so many different times uh, that I remember praying for payroll and the money to come to be able to pay for payroll. I mean, there's different times in my past when I had great jobs uh, like now, uh, but there's also times in my past where I know what it was like to lose a job. And there's maybe some of you even during this time, right now, that you've lost a job, things not working out, and you're questioning whether or not God is there for you. May I just encourage you, don't fear this time of barrenness. Just seek Him, be faithful. He has not forsaken you, He's not left you. And so the second thing we end up seeing in Scripture, uh, that I think is really interesting, in verse 9, Zechariah was chosen by lots. Uh, now it's interesting uh, this is also in, in, throughout Scripture in the Old Testament. A lot of times they use the drawing of lots to divide land. Uh, in the New Testament, really the, the new disciple was chosen by lots. 
Uh, and, and so we end up seeing this, that there's a sense of randomness. So I want us to say, don't fear random opportunities, but be ready. Uh, we don't see just life as a deist that just says, well, everything that happens, well, God wills. Well, there's some things that work out well, but there's other things that don't. Uh, as most know, I'm a Chiefs fan, and uh, the Chiefs won the Super Bowl last year. But for those who really are Chiefs fans, you know, what about 49ers fans? Or today about Bronco fans, you know? Uh, there's that dynamic that says, in random opportunities, I'm hoping for the very, very best to happen. Well, what about the other side? And, and so what do we, how do we look at random opportunities? Well, in this case, in Zechariah, the lot was drawn, and it was his opportunity. He was excited. He stepped up, and he was ready to step into it. We'll talk about his lack of faith in a little bit, but I think it's interesting that we can't just look at random opportunities and say, well, this is God's will that occurred. Sometimes random opportunities are good and sometimes not, obviously. But this is the mystery of God's involvement into time, into random opportunities. And when we look at this, that he shows his sovereignty, not just by controlling specific situations sometimes, but it's the fact that he's continually present throughout all of opportunities. Uh, Augustine said, and I love this as a quote, uh, Augustine said, every meeting is a divine encounter. Every meeting is an exchange of gifts. So I think it's a different way to look at random opportunities to say, how can I be ready in every situation to be God's hands and feet for this situation? To bring love, that thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, that I would take, look into this random opportunities like Zechariah and say, I want to be ready. I'm going to step into the temple and I'm going to do whatever God has me to do. Now again, we, we know that he has a little bit of lack of faith and we'll talk about that. But he was ready to step in at that random opportunity. I, I was reminded the last couple months, really the last six months, about two faithful staff members that have stepped up to be ready in the midst of random opportunities. That we never know what situations will come our way and that would come their way, but maybe you've heard the story about Candace and Dan McVeigh. They had a family member, uh, Tara, uh, that had been exposed to drugs at an early age at, in the womb and, and that because of some traumatic events, not to go into, but uh, they ended up deciding to step up and to be ready to be able to take that child and to adopt Tara into their family. They even moved to Arizona and moved, lived in Arizona and California for a period of months to be able to help the adoption process to go through. They stepped up to the plate. There's another staff member, and again, remain nameless just because of situations uh, legally. But I just wanted to read one of the testimonies of that uh, staff member that took in a child to help them during this season of time but their decision to be ready to be used by the Lord. Uh, our staff member says, It was a normal afternoon when my wife got the call from her brother. I could, not, I could only hear my wife's reactions, and they kept escalating. How long have they been homeless? Did they make it to the hospital? Where is the baby now? He says, I could hear the answers or the details, but I figured that our life was about to change considerably. We weren't looking to become foster parents when a call like that comes through, but there was a baby needing a home, I don't know anyone who wouldn't respond the way that we did. And then one other thing, he says, just from the beginning, we knew we were just filling in, that we were a bookmark, just a place mark in our story before he began his life with his new family. Even though we never imagined that we'd be fostering a baby after having our own children, though we, when we started, we were totally unprepared, but we would do it all again without a moment of doubt. I, I just wanted to highlight them as staff members because you have your own story. What does it mean to, be, to not fear random opportunities that come your way, but to have an attitude of, during this season, I want to be ready to be used by God. During this time, to not let random opportunities direct your fear and your attitude, but to have an approach to say, Lord, I just want to be ready. As Francis says, Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Let me be used by you. And you're doing that daily, 
not only for your family members and your coworkers and your community, but may you be encouraged that just like Zechariah, when the lot came to him, he was ready to step in to the best of his ability. And so let us not fear random opportunities, but be ready. Uh, you know, and I think especially about faith promise, whether it's Eswatini or stars, that God might be speaking to you to step into something. Uh, Max Lucado uh, says in his book, God Came Near, he says, regardless of the nature of our call that God speaks to us about, the consequences in our minds are still the same. It's a civil war. Though your heart may say yes, your feet say no, excuses blow numerously as golden leaves in the autumn wind. It's not my talent. It's not my time. But eventually, you're left staring at a bare tree and a hard choice. Will it be his will or mine? And so the question is, we want to be ready. Uh, the third thing is, in verse 13 to 17, the angel Gabriel then speaks to the promise of a child, Zechariah. And as he's speaking, he gives a promise and a fulfillment of something good to come. He says, a child will be born. And again, I don't want us to focus just on the fulfillment of the child being born, because as I talked before, sometimes uh, we experience loss. And so the, the promise of God is not just that the child is born, but that God is available. He is listening. He is fulfilling His promise, His covenant relationship with us. And so we don't need to fear our current reality. We should be expectant. We could lean into the fact that God has promises in store for us. Uh, Pastor Dave, months ago, and uh, talks about the fact that God always has a plan A, that there's not a plan B, that God is continually available, and His plan A is always there. Uh, and so we can be expectant that the promise of the child, the promise of John the Baptist, the promise of the Messiah was there from the angel Gabriel. And it's the same way for us and for here today. Sometimes the, the response, the circumstances is not what we wanted it to be. But yet we can still believe in a lot of different scriptures that reminds us that in Romans 8, 28, that all things, God is working for our good. In 2 Corinthians 4, it says that we have this jet treasure in jars of clay uh, so that we know that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. Though we do not lose heart, though outwardly we're wasting away, yet inwardly we're being renewed day by day. And so there's that promise again and again and again that we live in hopeful expectation. Isaiah 54 says, Though the mountains be shaken or the hills be removed, yet my unfailing love for you will not be shaken, nor my covenant of peace be removed, says the Lord. And so even when circumstances are occurring, we need to not fear that. We need to lean into hopeful expectation and be expectant that he has a plan A for us, that he's for us. The last thing I just want us to focus on is, and this is, gets a little bit confusing uh, for me, one final area is verse 19 when Gabriel says, I stand in the presence of God. I stand is in the present time. And, and so, not to be too Star Wars or Star trek in here a little bit, but uh, the whole idea of time, we look at the hourglass and, and we look at the possibility of how does God step into this time when He is continually beyond time. Uh, I, I'm reminded years ago when I read, uh, uh, well, Charles Ladd in his book about the kingdom of God says that, the kingdom of God is not yet, but already here. It's kind of that mystery that we're praying that thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It's not fully here, but it is here. It's among us, Jesus says. I remember when I was in college, I read the book uh, Reasonable Faith by Tony Campolo, and this really blew my mind. Listen to this quote. He says, time is relative to motion and at the speed of light. Time is an exasperable flow of successive events ceases to exist at all. So at the speed of light, for all of you JPL people, maybe uh, watching this, at the speed of light, everything is caught up in an eternal now. The temporal is caught up in the eternal, and it's difficult to put this all together. However, the more I read about the feel of astrophysics, the more I've convinced that now is part of eternity, and that eternity can be experienced now. So I'm led to believe that what I encounter now does not simply become part of dead history, 
but it's part of an eternal now that belongs to another level of existence. So what does that mean for us? It it means that when we live in the now, it's not just now. Uh, That that there's a connection to the eternity. There's a connection to eternal now. There's a connection to the God of all creation that fulfills His loving commitment to us. And that we then have a covenant relationship back to Him. That we can live in the eternal now. So I want, my desire for all of us, is that we would try to live in the eternal now. Not to live and be afraid of the past. To not be afraid and looking towards the future. But to enjoy and to really embrace the Spirit of God. What He wants to say to us now. That we haven't missed the timing. We haven't missed what God wants. Because the good news is is that if we missed an opportunity to serve him, there's going to be another opportunity and another opportunity. I I know when we look at different jobs, we say, oh, Lord, I want this job or this job. But the reality of the eternal now is the fact that he is that both of those opportunities. What is the best for us? What is the most gracious? What is the most healing? So we don't live in fear, but we live in the eternal now with our families, with our kids, with our co-workers, that this opportunity, God wants to reveal himself and to come in the midst of it and reveal himself. Uh, just one last thought is thinking about the whole idea of the Franciscan cross or the Franciscan prayer of, Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. That God desires to come in the midst of this uh, And say, Lord, not only does the Lord want to bring peace, but he wants us to help create peace. He wants to live in peace. And so he wants us to live in a time of uh, being ready to be able to serve him, uh, being faithful to him in his covenant relationship with us, that we are faithful to him, uh, that we are expectant and living with hopeful expectation and and not living in fear of the past. And the final thing is that that we would live with a, a sense that he is the eternal now, that though it's confusing, that we don't fear confusion, that we can live at peace, that we can be people of peace that search after him. And as we think about being used by him, that as God desires peace for our world, he wants us to be able to create peace and to work for peace. He wants us to be able to be the hands and feet, to be able to be the manifestation of his love and his grace into our hurting and broken world. You do that daily. May we continue to be encouraged that we don't have to live in fear, but we can enjoy God's timing for right here, for right now. Would you pray with me before we begin to move towards sharing communion together? Let's pray. Lord, as we step into the whole idea of you having specific will for Zechariah and Elizabeth, for John the Baptist, that you came into this world incarnate into the form of a baby, that sometimes we are in a time where we feel barren, we feel disgraced, we feel like that you are not there. For those centuries before you came, Lord, that people were, that we felt that you were silent. May you remind us today that your scripture shows us uh, that, Lord, that you desire for us to be faithful in this time. You desire for us to be ready to serve you. You want us to be expectant. You want us to be pe- people of peace. You want us to not live in fear of the timing, but to live in the eternal now that you are at work and that you are available and that you are present with us. And so, Lord, bless us during this holiday season, a very unique holiday season, that as we wait for you to reveal yourself, that we know that you are close by. Come, Lord Jesus. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Scott. We're going to take a moment and share communion together and respond. And maybe on this Sunday morning, as you think about Zachariah and you think about what Scott has shared with us, maybe you're feeling like uh, the timing is off for you. You feel impatient, you feel uneasy, you feel fearful, frustrated, tired. The strength's not in us, it's in God, and we take a moment to welcome him. And so, listen to the words, 
Let's sing together in these moments, and then we'll share communion together in just a moment. God, we gather in this place to worship from our different homes and locations in this present moment. Perhaps someone will be watching this an hour from now or two or five or one day or two days or three days. Would you enter into these moments? Would you take the elements that have been prepared across these different homes and families and would you now touch them by your presence and sanctify them for your use? May they be instruments through which your grace speaks. I pray for strength for people who need patience, strength for people who fear the timing, strength for people who are tired and overwhelmed. 
We dedicate these elements to you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And I pray that you would apportion grace to each person as there is need. The body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which is broken for you, preserve you blameless unto everlasting life. Take and eat in remembrance that Christ died for you. The blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, which was shed for you, preserve you blameless unto everlasting life. Take and drink in remembrance that Christ died for you and be thankful. And now, God, I pray that you would bring protection and grace, that you would allow each of us to take a deep breath and remember that your timing in our lives is good and that we would rest in that place and we would have no fear of the timing of the work of the kingdom. We pray it in Jesus' name, and everybody said together, amen, and amen, and amen. God bless you. Thanks for worshiping with us this morning.